for thousands of years, people have been saying, you can be who you want to be. If you think it, you can do it. Just, just make it happen. What in the hell are they talking about? What I want to do is I want to explore what that really means on a literal level so we can start to take it a bit more seriously, which means we got to turn to this lovely lady right here. Now, for the longest time, we used to think that the human brain just was kind of an all-purpose meat computer. So kind of information comes in your senses, it just ticks away, and out comes reality. It's kind of like your stomach digests, your lungs breathe, your brain thinks, that's it. And then we did this. I want to play a quick game with you. I'm going to pop a color up in this box. All you have to do is out loud as quickly as you can tell me what that color is. Are you ready? Green, blue, 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 green, blue, red. Oh. <laughs> green, blue, red, blue, red. Okay, well, it's decent, so long as the clicker works, but we all know our colors, yeah? Good. All right, round two, I'm going to pop a word in this box. All you have to do as quickly as you can, read me that word. Are you ready? Red, green, red, purple, blue, green, red, blue, purple. Sweet. All right, we know our colors, we know our words, we're good. Round three, you know this is coming. Anytime someone talks about the brain, you've got to play this. This time I'm going to pop a word up in this box, but each word is going to be written in a different colored font. Your job, out loud as quickly as you can, tell me what color that word is written in. So I don't care about the word, don't want to hear that word, I want to know what color the letters of the word are, yep? Here we go. Out loud so everyone can hear you. Blue, 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 blue. Okay, all right, wait, let's... <laughs> did, did you feel it? Did you feel that kind of crunch? If all we had was one brain, that should be just fine. But here we can feel this kind of movement, this push and pull. What we found out is you don't have a brain. You have dozens and dozens and dozens of mini brains scattered all through here. And each of these little mini brains has its own job. So when we see something like this, you got one bit of your brain that likes what? Red. Colors. It sees a color. It says, cool, that's my job, so what's it going to do? Whatever the hell the brain does, yay, that's me. You got another bit of your brain that likes what? Words. Does it care what else is going on in the world? It's got one job. Words, there's a word, I'm doing it. You've got color bit, you've got word bit, they're both going and we can feel that pressure. Now in the end, we are able to select one out. It takes a second, but we can go per red. So this means we must have a controller. Somewhere up here there must be one module, one system that can somehow organize and coordinate all those other mini brains. Now if you had to pick a spot where you think your controller lives, where in your brain do you think this guy sits? Maybe the br bingo. What's that bit of the brain that makes us essentially human? The prefrontal cortex, that magical thing. Guess where this guy sits? So here we go. We've got the controller up front, way in front of the brain. He's actually in there. I, bad animation on my part. We've got the color bit, we've got the word bit. They're both going off. Now what happens is the controller controls all of these things by sending out one signal. The only thing it can do is turn things off. So you've got color bit going, you've got word bit going, and the controller can say, nope. And that's how the brain works. This is how we talked about it for decades. World comes in through your senses, triggers off all these mini programs, and the controller goes, no, 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 no. Congratulations, there you go. And we thought we were done until this happened. Twelve black lines and one green square changed everything we thought we knew about the brain and how it works. So for some of you, it's already happening. But if it's not, what I want you to do is I want you to imagine that this green face Imagine it's like a piece of glass so we can see through it. I want you to imagine that the cube starts on that green face and goes backwards down and to the left. Cool? <laughs> when you got that, push it to the back. I want you to imagine that the cube actually starts here and it goes backwards up and to the right. And if you got it in the back, bring it to the front. And if you got it in the front, push it to the back. Is there anyone who can't do it? He's just going, what in the hell are you guys talking about? If you can't do it, just look away for a bit and come back. It might start to do it on its own. But for the rest of us, 
Am I changing this picture in any way, shape, or form? So the wavelengths coming off of here, hitting your eye, triggering programs are exactly the same right now as they were 10 seconds ago, yet you can see two different things. Who's doing that? Oh, it just happened over here, good. <laughs> According to our last theory, if all we have is a controller that can shut things down, this should come in and we can either see it or not see it. But here, we can change it. We can tweak it. If we want the green in the front, it comes out. If we want the green in the back, it goes back. Uh-oh. This means you don't have a controller. You have a coder. Sitting in the front of your brain is a little module that can send signals back to every other cell within your brain. Tweak how it functions at the molecular level so that you can experience the world in a way you think it should be, not in the way it actually is. And if that sentence doesn't make you feel uncomfortable, then you didn't understand what I just said. <laughs> Let's try this again. Sitting in the front of your brain is a module. This module can send signals back to every other cell in your brain, and we now know cells outside of your brain. Tweak how it functions at the functional level so that you literally see, hear, smell, taste, feel the world you think should exist, not the world that actually does exist. Easiest way to understand it. We used to talk like this. The world's out there, it sends signals in, brain processes, that's reality. We now know this isn't true. Sure, there's a world out there, there's something here, but at any one time we are pushing back and it's this we gotta deal with now. Now this leads to the important question. What codes the coder? If the coder is changing things up, what dictates how it changes things? In research, we tend to say, it's your schema. But the easiest way to understand it is this. It's your stories. The stories we use to make sense of the world, how it works, who we are, how we fit within it, how everything interacts, those stories drive our coder. Our coder then tweaks our brain so that is exactly what we get. In a very real sense, our stories drive our perceptions, not the other way around. Now, wait a second. We got a small problem here. If you, <laughs> I love dogs. If we've got this coder going all the time, that would take an incredible amount of energy. If this thing in the front of our brain was constantly tweaking, moving, shaking, changing programs, we estimate you'd only be awake three and a half, four hours a day. That's how much energy this thing would take. So most of the time, you're not actively coding. Your coder is doing this. It's simply predicting. Right now, none of you are actually listening to me, and that kind of hurts my feelings, but <laughs> you're all about one to two seconds in front of me simply predicting the words that are gonna come out of my mouth. And so long as these words are close enough to your prediction, you live in the prediction, not in reality. So long as our predictions work, we don't even need a world that makes sense. We can just live in our predict prediction and make sense of those things around us. Now here's what I want to do. How do we access our coder? If most of the time we're living in our predictor, how do we actively access our coder so that we can change the stories, so we can change the way it impacts this, so we can live, experience, understand the world differently? Now there's many ways to do it, but there are three primary ones relative to us, or relevant to us, excuse me. Number one is this, learning. It's the one thing we do all the time, especially in this setting here. The more new information we can bring in, the more we can attach that to our old stories and start to slowly tweak it and see something different. When we say you don't read the same book twice, we mean it. As you age, as you learn more, you literally understand, see, sense things differently. Our memories now, our understanding of the world at this age was different than 10 years ago. It will be different in 10 years. That's what learning is doing. It's changing our coder, which is changing our perception. Number two is this. What am I showing you right now? What is this? Is it clouds? Is it a map? 
Take a moment. What are you feeling right now? Confused. Do some of you feel kind of, kind of a little crunch maybe in your chest? A furrowed brow. What the heck is this? I can't quite make sense of it. Congratulations. Your coder is on right now. That feeling, that crunch, that oh, that is a sign that you don't have a clear prediction for the world, so you zip into the present, you're all here now, thank you, nice to meet you, and your coder starts actively, furiously working to say, how can I fit this into the world? Now I'm gonna put you back in prediction mode. Take this feeling, here's a prediction. And now let's go back. Easy as. Confusion. When we are confused, that sensation is the coder coming on saying, do I got to change? How does this work? How do I understand this? That feeling, that crunch, that's good. That is the sign that your coder is actively working. And in that moment, in that time, we get to start making decisions and choices about our story. Which brings us into idea number three. Now, I want to get us back into predictor mode here, so let's start with a quick question. How many senses does the typical human being have? I'm not trying to trick you all. I'm, how many senses does the typical human being have? Five, sweet, what are they? Sight, smell, taste, hearing, touch. Sweet, all right. And what if I told you that answer is totally wrong? that in reality, human beings have way more than five senses. In fact, at last count, we have about 21 unique senses. Now take a moment. What do you feel in this moment when something you hold dearly that you treasure turns out to be wrong? How many of you feel like, oh, the world kind of stopped, kind of focused, kind of curious? What do you mean there's 21 senses? Your coder is now back on again. Failure. When we have a prediction that fails, I must have pressed something, or when a screen does this. This is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. <laughs> when we have a prediction of how the world should work, and then it starts working differently. <laughs> you don't have a choice. You have, you have to jump into your coder. You, that is the sign that, uh-oh, my prediction doesn't make sense. And at this moment, I could die if I don't make sense. I need to write a new program to make sense of this for the future. So we've got learning, we've got confusion, and we've got failure. Those are the three biggest and easiest ways to access our coder. Now I'm going to end here. We have a quick problem with failure, and it's this. When you make a failure, when a prediction fails, your error alarm kicks on and you become hyper-focused. Your coder's ready to go. It would be wonderful if, if we just automatically learned at that point. Unfortunately, that's not what happens. Love it or hate it, any time you screw up, your coder kicks on, but at that moment, you have a choice. You can choose to engage with it. And if you choose to engage, your brain flips into a pattern that we call theta. And that means that it's physically changing. It's updating itself to say, okay, how can we make sense of this? How can we work? In other words, you learn from it. But if at the same point you say, oh, no, that's just too uncomfortable, don't worry about it, and you ignore it, your brain flips into a thing called beta. It starts to erase what just happened, and about 72 hours later, you'll forget that error ever occurred. You'll go right back to your prediction, and you'll probably make the same mistake again. So it's not enough to make an error. At that moment, you have to recognize that that feeling, that's the moment you get to pause and choose and say, okay, I'm going with it, let's learn. Or, mm, no, nah, life's good as it is, let's go backwards. There's not a right or a wrong, but I urge you, try and engage with as much as possible because that is how the coder builds our stories. That is the signal that, congratulations, we get to evolve, we get to grow. So thank you guys so much for hanging out. I hope, oh, we're back on. <laughs> I'll leave it there. I'll see you guys.